Kia ora and welcome to the final of four panel discussions that make up the Butcher Shop series, considering primary products, their place in our culture and how they define us as New Zealanders. The series is being hosted by Victoria University of Wellington's Enriching National Culture Area of Research Focus. And this evening's topic is wool, with other discussions in the series having looked at meat, wine and dairy. We're at Victoria University in Wellington's Law School in front of a live audience and I'm Simon Morton. So the big question that we're hoping to explore is, in 1982 there were 70 million sheep in New Zealand. Today there's well under half that. But at the same time wool's really popular in the world of high fashion as well as in the outdoor leisure sector. So, does wool and the high country sheep stations it comes from still play an important part in defining our national identity? And to help us explore this and a lot more, I'd like to introduce our panellists this evening. We have Claire Reno. Uh, Claire is a senior curator, New Zealand history and culture at Te Papa, where she specialises in the history of dress. And her love of wool is inherited from her father, Bill, who was director of wool studies at Massey University in Palmerston North. Growing up, acrylic was never an option. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel Easting and Angela, uh, sorry, and An Rachel Easting and Anjali Burnett yeah. are co-designers for Wellington-based fashion brand 27 Names, which they set up 10 years ago. And they manufacture all of their garments here in New Zealand. My daughter says you make really cool clothes and she wants one of your forest sweaters. <laughs> so <laughs> Mavis Mullins, uh, she's Rangitane and based in Danny uh, Mavis worked as a shearing contractor. She studied business, has run successful businesses, been involved in treaty claim negotiations and was recently inducted into New Zealand Business Hall of Fame. Definitely no pulling the wool over Mavis' eyes. <laughs> so the plan is that we'll hear from each of our speakers and then we'll open up for a wider discussion and we'll take questions from you. But before we get going, I feel a little bit of obliged to outline my own woolly credentials. I wear wool every single day. I worked in a woolen jumper factory when I was a student, pressing jumpers. I was working at R&R &R Sport in Christchurch in the early 90s when Graham Dingle came in with the first ever icebreaker and managed to get one. And I stopped stinking after skiing and spending time in the outdoors and uh, banished all the polypro away forever. Anyway, enough about my wooliness. Um, the session on wool is being recorded by RNZ National for broadcast later. So I'd like to start by inviting Claire to open up our discussion. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so I'm interested in the ways that the wool industry has really used fashion, beauty and celebrity as key partners in promotion. And as this series aims to explore the impact of primary industries on New Zealand's, um, or particularly here wool, on the nation's imagination, I was thought I'd just touch on three of my favourite wool promotions from different decades this evening. So in 1937, the New Zealand Wool Council along with its equivalents in Australia and South Africa, formed the International Wool Secretariat. Its two aims was to promote wool and to facilitate research. Both these things were becoming increasingly important with the emergence of synthetic fibres. From the beginning, the IWS uh, allied itself with high fashion as a way of promoting wool as a fashion fabric without equal, and it regularly dispatched examples of high fashion of garments New Zealanders could really only imagine to its member countries, such as New Zealand. Now, in 1948, a year in which wool earned New Zealand more than any other commodity, 23-year-old Marionette Burgess arrived for her first day at work as promotions officer at the wool board, and she discovered a wardrobe full of fine wool couture garments. As she admired them, her employers were quick to point out that New Zealand could not, of course, produce anything as fine. She understood this, but she knew that she could successfully use these garments to, quote, educate, promote and elevate wool as the greatest of fibres. Now, in order to achieve the wool board's aim 
of reaching out, quote, to every man, woman and child in New Zealand to make all essentially rule-minded, Burgess developed a promotional strategy to reach audiences beyond the fashion conscious. <laughs> Drawing extensively from the IWS's promotional material, including educational booklets on the history of wool, scientific reports, lectures and promotional campaigns from wool and national dress to the famous There's No Substitute for Wool campaign, she scripted theatrical productions in which the Secretariat's garments were presented as part of a larger story about wool and the properties that made it so versatile. So a wool lace negligee provided an example of a new discovery. It was woven with a strengthening thread of alginate right rayon derived from seaweed and dissolved as soon as you washed it, leaving only pure fine wool. She used a fine woolen cocktail dress by Pierre Belmain to demonstrate wool's suitability for summer and a printed Peggy Allen cocktail dress offered an example of the importance of wool exports, wool fashion exports to the British economy. Now Burgess's narratives emphasised, and I quote, the important part wool played in the history of our empire and, to quote a poster, the wealth of the Commonwealth and tapped into patriotism. She placed a special emphasis on garments that had been admired by members, members of the royal family. She used British tailored suits to demonstrate that although the mother country had been badly shaken by war, it had not lost its artistry. Only London had several row. Paris designers provided the glamour. Her favourite example was by Balmain. It was a evening gown from pale pink, Mousseline de Lange, and its hem measured an extravagant 20 yards. So she was in the golden age of couture. She also constantly in her narratives returned to New Zealand's role in this, what she called the miracle of wool, emphasising that while wool, and I quote, is a common bond of all peoples throughout the world, it is especially so for us, because wool is our story, the story of our progress and prosperity, and that New Zealanders play a very proud, definite part in this story. She very skillfully, she skillfully connected New Zealand as a producer of raw materials to those who transformed them, telling her audiences how fascinated the mill owners, mill operators in Yorkshire, or the great designers in London and Paris would be, quote, if only they could be here to view their works in wool in this great wool producing country. So now I'm flash flashing forward a decade when wool gets a bit groovy and according to the wool board wool set the pace for the 60s so in 1960 the wool board established their own high profile fashion awards a reflection of the country's growing confidence in local designers New Zealand Vogue editor Marie Stuttard exclaimed that nothing can compare to the drama of wool the wool mark was launched Hardy Amy's tried to introduce capes for men to New Zealanders and Pierre Cardin baffled us with his space age take on wool, while the, idea, while the Secretariat declared war on synthetics once again and nylon producers spoke out against the wool growers' antagonism. My favourite wool promotion story of this period, however, involves the wool board parlaying a disaster, a local disaster, the sinking of the Wahine in 1968, into a good news story for wool. In 1969, the dramatic story of the survival of a cocktail dress and a man's suit appeared in the New Zealand Woman's Weekly. While the owners made it safely to shore, it was months before their luggage was salvaged, salvaged out of the fuel, oil, slimy silt and rust of the hold. When Diane Wilson received her suitcase, the only garment not to have perished was her favourite party frock, a short wool knit dress by Fashion Built. And much to amazement, dry cleaning returned it to its former glory, and its fuchsia and emerald colours were as good as new. Mr Nathan's plastic suitcase disintegrated totally. However, his new wool suit, minus its synthetic lining, survived. <laughs> <laughs> so following you know, dry cleaning once again, relining, he was wearing it again, stating that he and his wife were now, quote, now more convinced than ever that there is no substitute for natural, natural fibres. Again, repeating, 
the well-known slogan, there is no substitute for wool. So I love this idea of a survivor wool, something which features in my last little story. And as to Papa is the final resting place for Shrek the sheep, the rogue Merino who was, became a global phenomenon and generated <coughs> tens of millions of dollars worth of media coverage for New Zealand Merino, I can't miss him out. He shot to fame after being found on Bendigo Station with 27 kilograms of fleece on his back, some of which was made into limited edition jerseys by Icebreaker, a company who forged their international reputation for Merino active wear in the 90s, a period when outdoor clothes, the outdoor clothing market was saturated with polyprop and polar fleece. In return, Icebreaker made Shrek his own little branded cover images of which were seen all over the world and resulted in a million hits on their website overnight. Now this sort of intimate relationship between the sheep, the wool grower and the wearer was strengthened in 2008 by Icebreaker when they invited customers to use their barcode to trace the origins of their jersey back to a specific sheep station and to an actual flock. So whereas Mary Nett Hay Burgess in the 40s and 50s worked, I think, to link our role as a wool producing country to what was happening internationally, Jeremy Moon of Icebreak has worked to link his international customer base back to New Zealand and to New Zealandness. And between these two sort of woolly storytellers, wool has dropped from being 11% of the fibre market to 1.1%. It's become a boutique fabric. And what surprises me when I look at the different decades of wool promotion is that despite all the positive stories, the same negative things have dogged wool. So at an IWS parade in 1940 at the Centennial Exhibition, audiences were assured that wool garments were no longer heavy and stodgy, that they could now be as soft and sheer as silk, as light and washable as cotton, non-creasing and unshrinkable as could be a line from a modern merino campaign. So 50 years later when Moon set out with Icebreaker, people still perceived wool as scratchy, as smelly and uncomfortable. These perceptions were repeated by the MC at the cam campaign for wool launch I attended in 2011. So I keep getting left thinking, have decades of wool promotions failed in making us positively, essentially wool-minded, as Marionette wanted us to be? Or is it simply that wool has to be constantly reinvented as something new for each generation of wearers? Shocking, 1.1% uh, uh, total fibre market is wool. I mean, that is incredibly low, so it sounds like some sort of reinvention is, is what's required. Sure. And maybe that's a good segue to our next two <laughs> guests, uh, Rachel and Anjali from 27 Names. So over to you guys. Thank you. So I'm Rachel, and this is Anjali, and we were both born and raised in Wellington. And after studying in Otago in fine arts and fashion design, uh, we came back to Wellington and started our label here. I believe we were invited tonight to um, provide some basic relief for the evening, <laughs> maybe with some Indian flair, I'm not entirely sure about that part, but um, yeah, although Rachel and I may look quite short and small, we have been going for a while and we also are stocked all the way from Gore to Auckland, so we sort of know a little bit about what the New Zealand woman may want out of her wool garments. So I feel like I come from quite a uh, fairly typical New Zealand family. My grandmother and my mother and aunt were all home sewers and knitters, so home knitting was something that um, I was brought up on. Um, I think that everybody has this sort of idea that wool is a really kind of comforting and warm and high quality um, fabrication to use and I think that's no different for us. We always use wool in our collections every season. There's a component um, and it's always been a staple in our, um, my wardrobe and Anjali's, especially I think when we went to Wellington Girls here and wore a wool skirt and wool blazer <laughs> and cardigan <laughs> and they lasted forever. So we've got this really, you know, this idea that, that it's quality and it should go on for as long as possible. Um, my mum is a proud Maharashtrian, but unfortunately her currency didn't travel well from India to New Zealand, so she bought all of our clothes second hand when we were growing up. I actually happen to really love this, even if it may meant I turned up to school in star bright pajamas, but <laughs> this it really didn't bother me and that's where I got my passion for fashion was having individual pieces that other people didn't have. And a lot of those garments were really cool hand knitted woolen things that other New Zealand mums had made for their kids that I got to then wear. So. Um, 
So like in terms of fashion, I guess we were children of the 90s and it was grunge was the area of, era of fashion at the time. So we were two girls from Karori going to op shops and trying to find ourselves like the best brown cable knit Kurt Cobain <laughs> sweater that we could find. And thankfully they were there because obviously there's the history of wool in New Zealand um, and we could find that kind of thing. And I think that's really amazing in terms of the fashion side of things that um, a, a huge international trend that was music driven before the age of the internet trickled down to nine-year-olds in 1993 being aware of that <laughs> um, and you know Mark Jacobs doing his famous collection in 1993 um, where he was fired from Perry Ellis for his grunge inspired collection I think is really important that you know it, it, it came all the way to New Zealand and it's still um, something that we were aware of as Karori normal school girls. Um, before our time in the industry, um, there was a massive industry here of clothing and fabric manufacturing. Um, we work with tireless New Zealand producers and luckily we can say we're 100% made, New Zealand made, but a lot has changed. So in 1992 the import restrictions were lifted and tariffs were lowered. The amount of clothing imported rose dramatically. So in 1989, 129 million was what, what, what we were importing, and then in 1999 it went up to 600 million. So in the space of 10 years, once those tariffs had been lifted, things changed dramatically. So the majority of our fabrics are unfortunately not sourced from New Zealand. We work with a small mill in Levin called Levana Textiles, and they produce, fa um, well, they... They knit wool. They knit wool yep. here in New Zealand, but they unfortunately have now are now this week just announced that they're moving their production to China. Mm. So it's really tough out there for New Zealand makers of wool. Um, on that note, so every collection we um, design wool and clothes and so we always have uh, some woven um, woolen garments and some knitted wools. So this jacket that I'm wearing this, even, this evening is a, a woven wool. It's 100% wool but it is woven in Italy because in New Zealand we just don't have the infrastructure and those kind of companies that are doing that kind of thing and I think it's really heartbreaking for us to not be able to source that kind of thing and actually make custom designs which this one is where we designed it with our um, friend who's a textile designer Marta Buddha um, and we came up with it and we chose all the colours and stuff and it's really nice to be able to be that creative with it but within New Zealand now there is actually no, no possibility of doing that. Um, so that's sort of one side of things with wool. The other way that we use it is in knitted garments, so like the cardigan that Anjali's wearing in my top as well. Um, we're really lucky to say that we actually do get to knit these in New Zealand. Um, a company in Tauranga is um, a fantastic uh, knitter of all sorts of um, items and they work with fashion designers and through to sort of souvenirs. I think they make a lot of blankets. Um, and I think that it is really you know, important for us to be able to keep working with companies like this and supporting that industry here because they're always going to be a really um, vital and important part of our range and something that I know that I will love forever. We've got so much knitwear in our own <laughs> personal wardrobe. It's <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> um, so when Rachel and I were talking about what we were going to say here, I asked her what it is particularly about wool that keeps us coming back to it because there are amazing fabrics that we see every season that are like really high tech and really amazing but there's something intrinsically good about wool that you just can't, even though it is only still now unfortunately representing a, such a small part of the industry, but we just can't let it go. So we just love it. We think it shows luxury and we won't, we don't think that we will stop using it anytime soon. And also we feel that responsibility to a woman in Gore who has like Marmite colored hair and she wears like a thousand woolen layers to the Hokanui Design Awards. She wants like a beautiful woolen dress to wear or like a blogger in Ponsonby who's wearing active wear but then wants a full length coat that just grazes her ankles, you know. So like <laughs> to have those options is important for us so that we can then hand them on to our mm. lovely customers. Yeah. So thank you for your time. Yeah. I've got just a quick question here. Are, are consumers today here in New Zealand, are they saying we want New Zealand wool? Is that something that you're, are you run three retail outlets and I know you sell your products throughout it's the country. Definitely if it's New Zealand wool, that'll be like a selling tick, you know, like, but it's not something that they are requesting. But also, when you write a garment label, the expectation is that you say where the f 
garment is made, but not necessarily where the fabric is from. So we'll, we'll say this is knitted in Tauranga, which is awesome, but then this Italy might, this wool might actually be from Italy. So it's sort of confusing. Mm. It's quite opaque, the mm. whole supply chain in terms of, because I know my socks are made in New Zealand, but I doubt the yarn was um, Absolutely. So there spun here. There's no spinning, um, virtually no spinning companies left in New Zealand. So yeah, you might have New Zealand or South American or Australian wool, but it's probably gone to China or somewhere else and then come back if it has been then knitted here. So yeah. Mm. Thank you guys. Yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> and I'd like to welcome Mavis. Mavis is a businesswoman. She has been inducted into the New Zealand Business Hall of Fame. You used to work as a shearer. Ooh. What a great background. <laughs> welcome. Um, kia ora. Uh, ko Ruahine Te Maunga, the Ruahine Ranges are my mountains. Ko Manawatu Te Awa, the Manawatu River, is my river. Ko Rangi Tāne, ngā Atihaunui a Paparangi, ngā Tirangi Nui, uh, so I'm from the people of Rangitane, Southern Hawke's Bay, Atiho Nui up the Wanganui River, and Ngati Rangi Nui, which is Tauranga Moana Way. Uh, called Mavis Mullins Aho. My name is Mavis Tenako Katoa. Kia ora to you all. Um, thank you for the opportunity. And Claire, I studied under your dad. That's how old I am, God. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, Bill Reno was a legend um, at Massey University in those uh, heyday of, of the wool diploma. Um, and so wonderful to listen to these young things and the amazing things they're doing. Um, I just want to take you on a bit of a different journey for a start. So, um, born and bred in Danny Burke, uh, and Although we were farmers, our family, uh, that was back in the day when farming was kind of subsistence-like, and to um, supplement our income, uh, our family were shearing contractors. So by trade, I'm a wool classer and very proud of that. Um, and I'll just give you a brief snapshot of what my upbringing was like. Um, so wool and shearing sheds was my upbringing. Uh, we grew up in that environment with grandmothers, uncles, aunties, cousins, brothers, sisters. It was all almost a community of family that worked in the shearing sheds. And we went to different farms and stayed on those farms for up to seven to ten days. And those farming families became lifelong friends. We go to each other's funerals, we go to each other's weddings. There's a kind of uh, a real New Zealand ink stuff that's raw and real about that kind of an upbringing. Um, hot scones, uh, mugs of black tea that was almost undrinkable. Uh, so that's why you had so much sugar in the blinking things. Uh, being in a shearing shed, which in this day and age is a workplace, so health and safety uh, puts a different spin on it, but that, those sheds used to be full of kids. We were there, we were helping or getting in the road, one or other. Um, when we got tired, someone would bake us a bed on the bale or the fadge of wool, so we slept smelling, you know, and even to this day, I walk into a shearing shed and I just got to kind of go, <laughs> um, I have been known to go to board meetings with um, uh, sheep stuff under my fingernails <laughs> and sit there and then um, try and flick it out, <laughs> you know, because you suddenly realise. Um, crates of big bottles of brown beer, you know, the big bottles, uh, guitars, singing, family, fun. That's what wool was for me. I didn't know it was an economy. I didn't know that it was anything other. To me, that was home, and it still remains it. So from um, the shearing sheds, uh, I'll tell you one more story. I started here in Victoria way, way back. Um, it was kind of fun, but not really. I ended up going home to marry this good-looking shearer. Still married to him, um, and we took over the shearing contracting business. And it was at a time when um, I went back to do an MBA, and it 
sort of struck us as we were going through this whole quality management thing that we weren't actually sharing contractors. We were first, we were sort of the first stage wool processes. And when you go from being a sharing contractor where you're, you know, dirty and all the rest of it, to all of a sudden understanding that we were the first step after the grower in terms of processing a product uh, for export, you kind of look at yourself a little bit differently. It became something a little bit different. And I guess that, that attitude drove me to um, being a lot more wool conscious about understanding the wool industry, not just in New Zealand, but offshore. Some of the stats I've heard here this evening break my heart, but I know, I know we know these things, don't like to hear them. You know, New Zealand, we haven't done a good job of telling our story. We have got the most amazing story that, that cuts across social, cultural, economic bounds, and we've never really told it. Um, and I kind of think the world is ready for some of these, this kind of a different story because it, it kind of is the essence of Aotearoa. You know, it's the essence of New Zealand. So um, I stepped away from the wall stuff after bashing my head against a brick wall for probably 10, 15 years to um, take on other roles, always with primary sector but um, I kind of felt like I'd been highly critical of dead wood <laughs> in the wool industry. They were my friends, unfortunately, but, <laughs> but then <laughs> I was always adamant that I wasn't about to be the dead wood. And so there came a time after the McKinsey report, for those of you who may remember, I was part of that, which kind of reconfigured the wool industry. Was it the right way? Probably not, but I don't know if we had any other options. Um, the wool board loved them dearly. They were good men with good hearts, but they didn't always do the shopping. They didn't always understand what wool was for a family. Um, and I'm just being a little bit, you know, on edge here with that. But uh, to me, this was, you know, it's part of having a sector, an industry that is truly reflective of not just the economics, but the tactile, the sensual, the beauty, the environmentally um, wonderful product that we have with sheep and wool. So anyway, I could go on forever, but um, really just wanting to share with you some of that um, social cultural whakapapa that sits within the wool industry. And it's kind of still there there's elements of it still there. Our daughter runs our sharing um, uh, business now. She's taking it over. And it's still very family-based. You know, we try to hold some of those things really tight um, within that sector. But um, I recently decided I I was old and older and wiser now. I've got to get back on this wall bandwagon. Drives me crazy that... Um, we don't have it sitting positioned where it needs to be. So I recently um, was appointed to the Wool Industry Research Limited, um, where we're looking for new uses for wool. Hard flooring, upholstery will always be there. This is for crossbred in particular, but we've got to find the new world. We've got to understand what does the new world want, need, and it's not always going to be in fabric and in garments. It may be, may be pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals. It may be in things like um, uh, capturing pollen and toxins in the air. You know, we've just got to get a bit wild about how we think about the fabulous properties that we'll have, we'll have so we can bring it back. Kia ora. <laughs> I'm intrigued there, you're, uh, uh, you presented some scenarios there for wool in terms of going forward mm -hmm. and the fact we have s less production, there are less sheep here today. What is the wool industry going to do to, s to stay relevant and I guess to stay in, in the marketplace? Well, we've got to rely on clever little things like these two for <laughs> a start and I'm going to take it on as a personal challenge to hook you up with some New Zealand wool. Can't have this... <laughs> Getting it from somewhere else, yeah, it just yeah, doesn't yeah. sit, so <laughs> we'll sort you out. Um, and it's that kind of uh, um, 
stuff that we do well in New Zealand. We know how to hook people up because, you know, two degrees of separation, we all know someone who knows someone. Um, we just don't often carry that all the way through. Um, but I do think that there is a role for wool. Um, no, I don't think I know. But again, we've just never been great at telling our story, whether it's red meat or wool or, you know, other, other primary sector um, uh, entities. We just don't tell our story very good. We try and flick up a wonderful photo of um, Mount Aurangi and think that will do it. You know, we've just got to get real about that um, supply chain, that value chain. It's got to be open and transparent mm. so that when you do have these gorgeous garments, you can say, and that comes from the Aotearoa Wanganui Incorporation mm. up the Wanganui River. <laughs> 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 or something like that. And we know those people and they they work their, their um, farming business to help supply us with what we need. You know, we've, we just, we've got all the elements here and we've lost them because we don't tell our story. And, and for me, the other thing is, we kind of all lived in silos back then. So this is my business and we'll just give it to you and that's yours. But you know, we just gotta open up and be a New Zealand Inc. It's a New Zealand Inc. story that we have to have. Do you see a country that has told the wool story well, better than us? No, no, no I don't. I guess um, if we're looking for great storytellers, it's Merino, it's mm. Icebreaker, uh, Perry Drysdale, you know, the final people have kind of got it. Um, and just because it's a fabric that you wear, it shouldn't, we shouldn't give up with crossbred wools. We shouldn't yeah. say because it is prickly, well, let's make it into something else then. Let's, mm. We've just got to be a lot more creative and we've lived too long on a memory that we have to re-energise. And the problem with Merino, if you travel anywhere around the world today, you're going to do any sports and outdoor store and every single brand now has a Merino offering. It's yeah. not New Zealand Merino, no. it's just Merino. Yeah. So they sort of lost, I guess, the, the story there in some respects. But I'm intrigued, Claire, to ask you, if you went out now and asked people on the street, um, maybe students from the colleges, uh, in terms of identity, do you think wool would be something they'd put on their top five in terms of their own national identity and where they're coming from? Or do you think it'd be Lord of the Rings and mm. the All Blacks? <laughs> Is it still relevant, I guess, today in terms I of identity? Know, I suppose because I grew up with it and embedded it in it, I've sort of, yeah, never thought to, I've not, I've not asked a lot of young people. I think if you're in the fashion, the design industry, yes, but um, I'm not sure, and I've, I've been surprised just in preparing for this, um, yeah, how much of a bad rap it, it is, and um, I suppose, yeah, I have come across a number of people that, yeah, it's, it is still seen as scratchy and not, not desirable. What about you guys, from your perspective? Do you think wool is still relevant in terms of identity? I, when I got here in the late 80s, wool was, you know, you had the black singlet at the pub straight away, mm. you know, and then you met mm. people and they worked on sheep stations and then you were surrounded by Mount Earnslaw and what have you. I was down in, in Central or Queenstown, um, not involved in the wool industry. Maybe it's nostalgia. I think it's probably more wrapped up in maybe nostalgia now a little. Yeah, I feel like in terms of like a, if I'm a consumer, I definitely feel like I, you know, want stuff like wool or silk or cotton, you know, like these natural fibres. And I think that those are really, really important in terms of like what I'd want in my wardrobe. I feel like for us as a brand, I definitely want to push those things because those are the things that are important to us. But I don't know if wool is like a New, as a New Zealand, um, you know, something that I would identify with as part of my kind of cultural heritage. I don't know if, if wool is something that springs to mind immediately, but I know that it's sort of intrinsically part of what I think about quality and clothing and that kind of thing. So I, I guess yes and no at the same time, <laughs> if that's an answer. <laughs> Yeah, the Merino one is interesting, isn't it? Because Merino has made wool so accessible. For, I mean, people wear it now every day mm. and it's become a sort of a, a, rather than a wool being a sometimes like a homespun jumper. Now we, socks and underwear and, mm. and the full spectrum. Um, do you think New Zealand can reclaim 
this fine wool, this, the fact that we have become boutique, what, 1.2% of wools you were saying? 1.1% uh, of the fibre market. Of yeah. the fibre is yeah. wool. Mm. I don't, Mavis? Personally, I don't think we have a choice. You know, I don't think we have a choice. It's um, when you look at what where we are, this piece of paradise, we are a big farm, whether we like to admit that or not. Um, we have issues around environmental stewardship, environmental kaitiakitanga or, or guardianship. Uh, the the sheep, you know, a sheep is a gentle animal on the land. Um, it's, it, yeah, and so therefore it, it sort of says to me that sheep will always be here, um, to what extent I don't know, but if we're going to make the most of this beautiful country and still enjoy the, the environmental beauty and, you know, I'm not going to say purity because we haven't quite got the earth right. back to that, but that is a goal. Um, then, then sheep are a viable option for that. And I think what we need to do is just get our heads in the right space around um, red meat and wool because, you know, for a lot it is the one animal that does this. Mm -hmm. uh, because I keep thinking even though sheep numbers have gone down, Wool is still just under a billion dollars. You know, I mean, I don't sneeze at that. It's it's not big and sexy like the Fonterras and Co. But our challenges aren't the same either. You know, so um, it's just it's kind of like owning up to what you really are, what you're really good at, and how we make the most of it. And as I said, not that I'm the biggest, uh, the big uh, PR company for Merino, but Fine will have done a stunning job of of the story and the product development that that kind of goes there. We just have to do the same with our crossbred wools, which is what's found in the North Island predominantly. And there are, um, there are moves afoot to do that. And just one quick example. So I do chair the Aotearo Whanganui Corporation. Um, it's a big farm, 100,000 acres. It sits under the shadow of Ruapehu, down the Paraparas. Uh, we have 200,000 stock units, sheep, beef, dairy. We have 3,000 hives, you know, it's, it's substantive. Um, our view is not about the market now. Our view is about the market tomorrow and how are we positioning ourselves for the market tomorrow. We're long players, so we're here in the long game. So the short, the short money, is great, but we're trying to be very brave and turn away <laughs> for the greater, you know, the big, the big picture. And with wool, um, last year we engaged through Merino New Zealand with a family company in Norway called Glerips. They make gorgeous felted slippers, and of course, I guess when you live in that part of the world, you need them. Um, but their family came down to. Um, the Whanganui Hills, we walked, they met the shepherds, they saw the sheep, they saw our waterways, um, they love the story, they love the connection. Now they say they're there for generations and we're saying, so are we, yay, high five. So we, you know, those are the kind of connections that we're starting to look for in terms of processing where that pipeline is open and transparent we know who everyone is, we know what they're getting, you know, everyone wins out of this thing. And it's more and more where customers are going as well, they, yeah. they, want, they want that as well. That's right. I think that's why the barcode ends. and all of that has worked so well. Yeah. yeah. More sheep, less cows, a bit controversial, but <laughs> I hope you don't mind me, <laughs> I'm just bracing. <laughs> I wanted to share something with you because I was blown away as a as a as a wool wearer and having done this sort of uh, gone through the uh, the polypro to wool conversion myself and said oh it's antimicrobial it's great I haven't washed for a week <laughs> you know and getting everyone to smell uh, smell smell me um, 
I only discovered two weeks ago, I was at Otago University, and Rachel Lang, who's a professor uh, in textiles, and she's at the science, uh, textile science and technology department at Otago, she has worked with a food chemist, and what they've done is essentially measured volatile compounds, which is another way of saying smells, uh, and this food chemist synthetically made these smelly odours, and they exposed cotton, synthetic fibre, and wool to these volatile compounds and using chromatography, they gas chromatography, they were able to measure the absorbency of the volatiles into the fabrics and then also the release profile. So they showed me these curves of, of, of these various fabrics, well, the three, cotton, synthetic and wool. And the wool one was really intriguing. The reason it doesn't smell post-exercise is, and they don't know why yet, but they think it's got to do with the, the actual, the way the protein and the way the, pro the, the hair is built, the, the wool. Mm -hmm. Here, the, the piece of wool. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's got this really slow release profile, and so hence you can exercise, work out like I do, not wash for weeks, and no one will say you smell um, because the wool will hold on to these volatile compounds. When you wash them, off they go. With the synthetics, when you sit down after your bike ride or your tramp, your body heats up and these volatiles, well, they, they get volatile and so <laughs> <laughs> that person on the bus that smells with the uh, tracksuit in, there you go. So that's another good, re another good reason to, uh, to make sure you wear wool. <laughs> Hey, I'd like to open it up to the floor now. If anyone's got any questions, we'd love some. And the way it's going to work is that Steve has a microphone there. So if you just whack your hand up and make sure that you just hold the microphone, ask the question. That way we can edit for the question and make sure it all sounds beautiful. Thank you. A couple of hands here. That's a great jumper. <laughs> Actually, that is Sweater of the Evening Award. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Just to describe it, we have, is that a story on uh, there? My name is Sunita and I'm interested in sustainability. And for that reason, um, I would wear natural materials um, most of the time. And indeed, this is a pure woolen jersey that my mother knitted 29 years ago, <laughs> wow. and it's still going strong. Um, so, you know. <laughs> And the question that I have for you is, um, being a sewer as well, I like to use merino fabrics, for instance, which are often reinforced by about 4% lycra, um, which holds the material better, it keeps shape better, um, it makes it stronger. But s in terms of sustainability, uh, it's not decomposable anymore. Um, you know, what does the industry do about that? I'd like to know, can I actually use these materials responsibly? <laughs> How does it work? I'm not the designer and stuff. <laughs> Do you know, I think, um, I, I'm, I'm big on sustainability too. It, it, it has to be the hallmark. But we live in an age today that is different. And so it is about sensible, you know, sensible use of the new technologies. I want to say that um, it is, the, with wool, um, wool research, we're investing, I think it's reasonably sized um, amounts of money, millions of dollars a year, into understanding and trying to um, not replace, but to have an alternative for these kind of fabrics, not just for sewers, for um, clothing, but even materials. Um, whether it's, as you say, active wear, you know, um, yoga stuff and, you know, just a lot more of these um, activities now that kind of uh, bring us back to being a lot more grounded and how we ensure that the fabrics that are used in those activities also have that same grounding, that they're not derived from... Um, from materials that are harmful. And I guess one of the big things for me around that whole sustainability, it is about understanding, um, from a Māori perspective, we like, you know, we give, our, we give the land a name, we give her a face. So fabrics, materials, actions, activities, um, it's always with this face of a grandmother, a mother, that we undertake them. So whether it's too many cows or not, 
whether it's um, harvesting uh, materials or even producing materials that's harmful. You know, it, it's always something that sits top of mind. I'm not saying for all Māori, but certainly for the entities that I'm involved in. Mm. Very top of mind. Mm. I don't know if I've answered your question. You mm. girls are probably and better. And I think sustainability, particularly in the clothing industry, is so complex. And, mm. you know, it is a minefield. And I think, you know, there's some... Um, I think Lucy Siegel in particular has written a really good book on um, is fashion um, killing the world. But and it's a great read because it sort of helps you through that minefield. And I think individually it's sort of up to people to work out what... Yeah what pathway to sustainability suits them and their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So if a little bit of nylon and a wool actually makes that garment last several years longer and a whole lot more wears, mm. and you know, you're not buying another 10 garments to replace it, that actually could be a positive thing. So mm -hmm. I think there's a whole way of looking at the sustainability issue. I think as well, when we're choosing fabrics, for example, if we've got an option of choosing an 100% wool or a wool that's mixed with a blend with nylon or let's say it's blended with viscose, we might go towards either the 100% wool or the viscose because the viscose is obviously a mm -hmm. naturally derived product through wood pulp rather than a plastic, essentially. And so I think that, you know, in terms of when we're choosing our fabrics, particularly like at, at the design phase, it is really important for us to choose as many fabrics for the collections as possible which don't have extra rubbish in them that, that no one really should be, you know, indulging in. So, um, yeah, I feel like we try our hardest within the kind of sphere of what we have available to us to, to choose as many things without, like we never use nylon or, you know, we just like try to be like 100%. We just look at the fabrics and just skim past all the I ones know. that have the crap in them. They, they have like yeah. racks and racks of fabrics and they'll be like polyester and we're like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, <laughs> move on to the next thing. Yep. Next, because we don't even want to look at it because it's just, you know. We're not adding anything, yeah. you know? Hmm. Thank you. Hold, hold on, hold, no, 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 you have to have a microphone, sorry, otherwise you get ejected. There's <laughs> Each seat has there's a button down here at the front and you get fired or out or through the roof there. Oh, sorry, no, you can ask a question mic. after. Oh. oh, there's multiple microphones. Hmm. Oh my gosh, we've got two microphones, this is a crisis, Steve, what are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> Just we'll start, sorry, with this lady down here. Rosemary Cole, I hope. Can you hear me? Oh, um, I've got two questions actually. Were the panel aware that as well as book groups, there are knitting groups? There's mm. the crafty volunteers attached to the Wellington Central Library. There's a knitting group attached to the Southern Cross and men and women go. And the second is, um, with your reinventing of wool, is it possible please to reinvent it? so? shops, department stores like Farmers and David Jones sell wool because otherwise there's just knit world. <laughs> so can, can we reinvent wool? <laughs> I think, um, look, that obviously that would be where we'd want to get to. So I, I, I don't know if it'll be in your lifetime or mine, but <laughs> you know, I think that we have to start with a goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it has been wonderful with the whole knitting revival and the whole craft revival to see shops like Holland Road opening up that do specialise in um, sort of high quality woolen yarns and so forth as opposed to acrylic. Mm -hmm. So there are more and more sort of, I think, specialists and people like Nikki Gabriel that are sort of um, beginning to emerge that are re-embracing that. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to comment on the sustainability question that was there before around the waste and the end of life. We actually do quite a bit of full life cycle assessment work with New Zealand Merino, looking at all life stages of wool. And if you look at the whole life cycle, like from growing the wool through to um, manufacturing, and then also take the use phase into account, that is where some of the real benefits come in, because you have to wash it less and also it lasts a lot longer. So I think it's not, we don't have to focus just on that end of life mm. and disposal where we might have a little bit of nylon in there because if that helps to extend the whole life cycle and the 
life of the fabric that might actually be from a sustainability point of view be a big advantage mm. so it's just looking at the full life cycle rather than just the end of life is what we would focus on mm. interesting thought although having seen how opaque the, the the whole fashion industry is and the way consumers make <coughs> decisions today it's fairly blunt i mean you have sportswear companies and you go on a website and work out where you're going to buy are you going to go for a tick or are you going to go for three stripes and they have all of these sort of environmental sustainable credentials I can't help thinking it's a little bit crude still, but we need more transparency in, in fashion, full stop. Mm. And try the Good On You app. The Good On You app? Mm. I might download it now. Yeah. <laughs> Get, what does it do? Um, it sort of rates um, companies, uh, it's mainly I think Australia, but New Zealand has recently signed up for it so you can go on and look at your favourite company and see where they rate on a number of issues. So one is about how they treat um, you know, human resources, um, environmental and I can't remember what the third one is. But yeah, so you can have a little yeah. see how your favourites rate. Um, I wonder if someone should persuade um, a political party in the coming election that we should have a tax credit for people who wear wool. <laughs> 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 but seriously, um, I wonder about affordability because, I mean, I mean Claire and Anjali and, and Rachel have talked about the very high-end mm. users of wool, and obviously that is not cheap. And when you think about, you know, why people don't wear wool, that could be a reason. And I wonder, Mavis, if you've got any suggestions to offer about how wool, and perhaps crossbred wools are the way to go, could be made a more affordable fabric or a more affordable material for people who are, you know, not having an easy time of it. Yeah, um, thank you for that. <laughs> um, and I guess that is the, the kind of reservation I have. Yes, we are re-energising the wool sector, but it is high end. Um, <coughs> And that affordability is a big thing for us. I know that in some of the research, we're trying to make a 33 micron wool, which is the prickly stuff, feel like a 21, <coughs> excuse me, or an 18 micron. There's still some way to go with that. <coughs> but there is, you know, in science and research, it's, it takes, it's gonna take a little while, but, um, it's about not giving up on it. Sorry, I don't have any <coughs> any any fabulous um, suggestions around that other than, yeah, we've certainly got to keep trying on it. And <laughs> my understanding is that the wool levy uh, a few years ago, farmers decided to stop paying that because <coughs> they were sort of at a stage where they weren't getting enough money and they were wondering how this was going to play out, where was the R&D going to happen, what, how much was it going to cost, what was in it from them. Has that changed? Are farmers today, are they keen to invest in the R&D required to take wool into the next phase? It's I, mean, I guess it's a loaded <laughs> question, it's a loaded <laughs> reply because of your... It's a, it is an interesting question and um, unfortunately I've, I've said this to farmers before but you know sometimes I think farmers are worse than Māori, they just can't get together and get going. Um, <laughs> it's, it's very frustrating but um, so I was involved in that wool levy uh, but we had seen pre the stopping of the levy, generations of waste. And as a farmer, when you are um, kind of squeezed and your income is cyclic, you know, probably a five year cycle, um, you do look at every cent. So, you know, it, there was just no appetite to continue pushing money into research and development that was actually supporting other wool growing countries other than ourselves, you know, it was just dumb. But what we didn't do is we haven't put the right thing in place to replace it. Um, farmers do have an opportunity to invest in research and development now through, um, uh, through RONS, Wool Research, and uh, Walls of New Zealand, uh, whether they choose to or not, you know, and the story is really they're not choosing very wisely with that because we do have to have that big... R&D budget, so it's it's not a nice, it's not a good story, but um, 
and I'm going to push another barrow now. I think one of the, uh, for me, one of the saving graces is the fact that uh, for Māori, land is a big asset. It's one of our biggest asset bases, the primary sector. And we've seen Māori starting to challenge the status quo, and I think about Fonterra. Uh, you know, we now have a Māori milk plant, Miraka, that is doing extraordinarily well. So that kind of gets your tail up a bit, thinking, gee, if we did get together, um, we could make a difference for New Zealand Inc. And there's a lot of these kind of discussions starting to happen. And I guess if you have a big um, bulkhead, you know, uh, it, could, it could initiate a change. Always the optimist I am, <laughs> but um, why not? We've got nothing to lose. <laughs> Who in the room has a woolen item? Could you put your hands up, please? Who's got a woolen item? So everyone has put their hands up. Who has a woolen carpet in their home? I'd say 80%. So we've got consumers here. We've got people mm. that know wool, that own wool. In my case, love the stuff. I really do love wool. Um, I guess the challenge is, how are we going to turn wool into cars? How are we going to turn wool yeah. into our built environment? How are mm. we going to build wool into the airplanes that we fly in? Yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a huge challenge, isn't it? A technological yes. challenge. Yeah, but technology is all around us. It's accelerating the way we live, work, um, by rate of knots that we've never seen before and that's why I think you know let's not give up on this thing yet because technology is shifting the dial every day we just have to make sure we're still on the radar <laughs> a couple more questions we've got time I'm looking at uh, my, my director executive producer <laughs> yes we do we've got microphones thank you um, actually, that just somewhat uh, comes on to what you were just saying before, but um, with a lot of industries, uh, the threat of low cost of automation is actually a threat, but in this case, is this regarded as a potential benefit? And when you're starting to look at the offshore processing, is this something that we could bring on um, back onshore, you know, and perhaps leverage some of the young minds rather than X prize for sending rockets into space, could we have a Shrek prize or something? <laughs> Um, I spoke to the owner of the company that does our knitwear um, and he had basically said to me the, the really sad thing about what New Zealand lacks at the moment in terms of companies that do their own spinning so that then we'd be able to you know, actually use the New Zealand wool is the, like, the quantity, um, prop like the ones, the, the ones that we've got here at the moment, I think... Um, are dealing with a sort of setup that's based on bulk, and so they might be able to spin and dye 200 kgs worth of wool when we want to make a run of 45 sweaters. So we can't actually end up like choosing their product um, and b and being able to like essentially like work within their their minimums. Um, and he was like, I think that we've missed a golden opportunity of being the Italy of the South Pacific because we could have had this huge industry still going with you know milling and weaving and knitting um, wool, obviously, um, and, w and we just don't have that anymore. And he said, if you had a spare 20 million, I reckon you could set up your own spinning facility and then you could go forth and make many you know, amounts that peop you know, the likes of us who are essentially boutique and very small in terms of the, m the big market of, of what we'd be able to you know, actually use. Capture the artisan mm. market. Yeah. Mm. You'd need sharing robots, though, wouldn't you? Mavis's <laughs> family. <laughs> 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 Have we got microphones over there? Lovely, thank you. I've got a small uh, hand weaving business and I'm just putting a warp on my loom at the moment. It's with Anna Grattan's yarn from Fielding. I'm putting 27 kilos, a uh, kilogram, sorry, kilometres of yarn on my warp and I'll do a run of 10 blankets. Last run I did only three of those warp ends broke. It's really, really beautiful Corriedale, grown and spun in Fielding. So there are suppliers out there, we just need to support them and use their yeah. products. Mm. And you make Fantastic. beautiful work. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to ask 
ask Mavis a question. The, um, the, there's been a lot of speaking about high-end fashion and things, but no one's really spoken about the carpet industry. Mm. We bring all, a lot of visitors come back, well, <coughs> expats come back from overseas with carpets tucked under their arms from Afghanistan, India, and Iran. We should be doing the same here with yeah. our carpets. Government House has fantastic carpets on their floors. Those are the sort of things that I think would be absolutely brilliant to have our visitors roll up and take home with them. It's, it's crossbred wool. It's the wool that is pretty much most of New Zealand. Merino is a very small part yeah. of the wool production here. Yeah. Could that be a possibility? Or how does it work? Big question, sorry. Yeah, no, thank you for that question. And I mean, common sense kind of tells you it could, should, but the economics, I think, have have gone the other way. Um, so we have a direct supply, and, and in another entity I'm involved with, we are investors into Cavalier. We used to be shareholders in Feltex. <laughs> um, you know, it's tough. And a bit like the, the young ladies here, when they get their swaths of fabric, you go into a carpet shop. You know, it's not easy to buy a wool carpet. No. We built a house four years ago. I just about had a fight with a carpet <laughs> lady in Palmerston North who was adamant she was going to sell me solution-based carpet. You know, and I just, it was just, it's a, it's a difficult, um, it's a difficult issue because it's the whole pipeline that's defunct or dysfunctional. It's still there, but it's not healthy. So you, it's there's just not one answer. But I I totally agree. I just it just it's a it's a it's such a sin that we've allowed it to get to this place. But um, yeah, there are small processes who are doing um, lovely little things, but actually we need scale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need. We need the big bulk stuff, and unfortunately, what that then does, it puts us into a commodity cycle. So you know, uh, I, don't worry. I've I've had sleepless nights about this. <laughs> you have to understand. <laughs> it, it bothers me that there's no flash of inspiration that can help. <laughs> I think too, when you're going to Turkey or Afghanistan, yeah. you are uh, you're also buying into um, a cultural story. Yeah. Um, you know they have, um, you know, Turkey. There's you know centuries worth of textiles traditions there. So when you're buying that carpet, you're sort of buying a whole part of that history and culture and taking it home with you. So it's about what you're saying. We have to develop our own stories, and it has yeah. to be the right cultural product yeah. here. You c you can't sort of latch on to someone else's tradition. Yeah. Yeah. And you can sort of see again small boutique runs like people like Stansborough who have oh. got all those sort of wonderful looms from the old Petoni woolen mills, mm -hmm. um, you know, producing beautiful, beautiful textiles. But again, small. Yeah. yeah. So as well as the homespun jumper, we need homespun carpets. That needs to be a new sector that... Maybe it's another Hang thing on, on your it. things yeah. to do, yeah. Lester. Get the farm <laughs> sorted. <laughs> have we got time for one more question? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, w well, we can think in decades, if not centuries anyway. Um, so I, I want to ask about the attributes and images that you would use to position wool. Uh, Mavis, I understand your joy in going into a shearing shed and that smell, and I understand that and I like that. Mm -hmm. But if you import that, sh that smell uh, into mm. a shop in, in uh, Willow Street or Lampton Quay, yeah. will that sell more? Uh, wool products? Probably not. <laughs> um, and also, it seems to me that horses and dogs and tussocks, which are a natural uh, image, have been uh, appropriated to sell beer. <laughs> um, so that raises the question, what sort of attributes and images or emotions and, and concepts would you use to position wool? And then how do you link that through to our culture, which is the theme of this, this series? Um, I'll start for us. But for me, the, 
You know, the imagery that I have is about protector, a protection, soft, warm, embracing. Um, and they probably don't always come from, you know, those mountainous landscapes. But I think there's a real romanticism about the images in wool sheds. You know, if you want that history, don't, without the smell, of course, because um, I agree. Uh, but, you know, just how you can go into some of these wool sheds and that soft light that's coming in through on those timber floors and walls and um, beautiful old machinery and, you know, there's, there's a whole package of images there for me. And that's just me and obviously I know it and it's mine. But... When we show those images also to, um, uh, like we do some work with Dixie Walls in the States, they love that imagery. They love um, the, the look of families in those beautiful, lighted, lit um, sheds, you know, with a bit of a vista out. <laughs> um, but they're real, they're not fake, you know, those are real. They're real things, but uh, you're right, we've, we've kind of lost ground to other people with some of those images. Mm. What about you girls? What do you reckon? <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> I like your customer, because that's that thing, because there's so many different customers and you need... Yeah, I don't think yeah. our customer would be interested in seeing a paddock with a sheep and, yeah. like, beautiful, like, a family situation going on. That's not how we would sell a coat. Like, we yeah. have to sell our stuff that is engaging and inclusive and beautiful. That's yeah, how we yeah. sell our stuff, by making yeah. people feel like, yeah, I could totally wear that and that would look great on so me. It feels like sort of city and urban. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think mm. that's what Marinette Hay mm. was trying to do in the 40s. She was trying to appeal to all these different people and that's why she picked up all these stories to try to link to the farm, to link to Paris, to link in... I, you know, there are, mm. yeah, it's such a big audience yeah. and all those products are so different. Mm. So I think it's like multi-layered. You can't just True. do one one approach. Yeah. Because, mm. you know, you can see the icebreaker with mm. the Southern Alps and th that's just worked like a dream for them. Yeah. Um, but it's not, it's not it's everything. Not everything. No. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Mm.